Good morning, everybody. Uh, well, afternoon, actually. Good afternoon, everybody. It's um, a pleasure to be with you uh, today and to talk about new resources that have been released for uh, parents in particular, but others within the school divisions. Um, obviously, this is the first day back for teachers and others in our classrooms as they prepare for the return of students on Monday, uh, sorry, on Tuesday after the long weekend. And I know that there's a lot of anticipation uh, about the September 8th start date, uh, but there's also a lot of anxiousness. And while anticipation and anxiousness is not new to the start of school, that's those are probably hallmarks of every school year, this is obviously different. It isn't the same. Uh, and that's true uh, for myself as well uh, as a parent. Uh, for my wife and I, we know that it's a different school year for our son, but we are excited that he's going to be back in class uh, on Tuesday, but also uh, anxious for the differences that are coming with it. And across Manitoba and really across Canada, when I talk to other education ministers uh, or watching some of your news broadcasts, we certainly see that there is that uh, anxiousness. And to the best of our ability in terms of providing answers in, adv in advance of those questions, we hope that that will uh, alleviate some of, uh, of the anxiousness. Information, of course, is power, and whenever you can provide that information, uh, you're helping uh, parents and others who are working in the system. So now on our education website, uh, edu.gov.mb.ca, there are now a series of resources uh, that are provided, uh, I think, in an uh, easy-to-digest uh, format for, for parents and others to get some of the answers that they need. There will still, of course, be questions and interactions with individual schools and school divisions, as there is every year between parents uh, and others in the education system. But I think that these resources uh, are, are very helpful and uh, and hopefully parents now have uh, a few days to to review them and to the extent they didn't have some of their questions answered before hopefully this uh, allows them to get some of those questions answered so again I want to um, uh, say to all those uh, teachers and others who are back to school uh, today in terms of preparation the work that you're doing now today in preparation is incredibly important work for next Tuesday. Not easy work, not work that you might have anticipated a year ago, but incredibly important uh, because I know that you'll set the stage for a confident and a safe return for students on Tuesday. And we have incredibly dedicated, hardworking and skilled professional teachers and EAs and others in the healthcare system who step up to a challenge because they want what's best for the students that they're entrusted with. And I know that this will be uh, no different, even though they're back a little bit earlier than might have been anticipated uh, many months ago. Um, they're, of course, applying that with their professional dedication, as they always, always do. So we look forward to next Tuesday welcoming students back, as I now look forward to your questions. Minister. Can you explain why Brandon and Prairie Mountain schools are yellow and the region's orange? So the the coding system that's been developed by the province of Manitoba, uh, BARD, are, are triggers that um, are used by public health. And so public health makes the determination in terms of areas or individual institutions. So for example, in in my community, the uh, Bethesda place uh, is or was under a red classification because of the unique circumstance there. The entire community, however, wasn't. Uh, my understanding from public health is uh, they've made the determination that uh, because of uh, the special provisions and protocols that are happening within schools, that it is safe for them to be at a yellow daily release of statistics about the number of students, teachers, or other people in schools who are diagnosed with COVID-19? So I think that what public health has indicated is that they intend within the 
uh, daily uh, press releases that they put out to indicate, um, you know, information where there's been positive cases uh, in schools and I think, you know, where there's been an infectious period within the schools. We have to remember that every time a student, um, you know, possibly is, is confirmed for having COVID-19, that doesn't mean that they got it in the school or that they ever were in the school, right? Particularly when I think of high school students, they're out into the community all the time. Um, there's never a sense that, you know, they've been at home for the last many months and now that school is starting, now they're off into, uh, into, into school leaving their homes. They've been in the community for many months to, doing what young people do, uh, working at jobs and interacting more broadly in society. So they're, you know, I think the public health will look at, as they always do, when there's a confirmed case, where did the case come from? Who are those close contacts? Is there a vulnerability within a school or a cohort? And then make, uh, make those pronouncements. So you mentioned the anxiety that parents are facing uh, leading up to this. There's less than a week to go. Um, and there's some voice and frustrations that this information is just being released now. How, what's your response to that and why release these details uh, in a package format now? So I think part of it is, you know, you release the information when it's uh, best able to be released. There's no question that everyone in a situation like this and the pandemic more generally, right from when this sort of hit our radars in, in late February or March, everybody wanted information on everything as quickly as it could be provided, uh, which is natural and understandable but providing quick information isn't always providing good information. And so we needed to work through um, protocols with public health. Those are where those protocols, primarily when it comes to safety for students in schools are coming from, how the responses will be, how public health will uh, notify schools and officials. Those had to be worked through and they had to be worked through well. So I would much prefer would I have preferred to have this document out a month ago? Sure, uh, but not in a form that wasn't uh, is, is clear and as good as it could be. So I'd much prefer to have a very good document out a week before a poor document uh, a month prior. Um, Minister Gerson, you mentioned you are getting a lot of questions from parents who are concerned. What are some of those key questions that kind of keep coming up? Well, look, I mean, here's the interesting thing, right, is that uh, a, pan a pandemic um, clearly proves to be divisive and it divides people and so I get lots of uh, emails and um, messages in various forms um, and um, you know sometimes people think it might all be kind of of the same thing well we'd like more of this or less less of that but there's a lot of division and so I do hear from a lot of parents who say well we're concerned about uh, going back to school and what that's going to look like for for our children. That's clear across the country that uh, that those concerns, regardless of the plans of any province, of any government, of any political stripe, those are those are common concerns about whether there's enough. Uh, and then I get uh, many concerns each and every day that says there's too much being done, and we're worried about our children going back into an artificial environment, and we don't like the mask mandate, and. And uh, so there are concerns that happen on both sides of, uh, of these issues. They're significant, they're all emotional. Um, but whether I'm reading a stack of emails that says, you know, we'd like to see far more done on this particular issue because we're concerned, or a stack of emails that says there's way too much being done and this is going to harm children because we think it's gonna hurt them, you know, psychologically and you need to, you know, stop trying to scare children. Well, those are both important because they're coming from Manitobans and they're expressing their views. We rely on the public health advice, quite apart from the emotion. We have to rely on the public health advice. That has to be what drives this, not you know the, the, the various concerns uh, that exist on one side or the other because they can't be resolved. The reality is that of all the different concerns that we're getting, you can't take all those concerns between too much is being done and too little is being done and try to resolve them. What you can do is what you should do in a pandemic, and that's listen to health experts in Manitoba who are driven by the Manitoba context. 
some parents haven't made decisions about what they're going to do next week with only a few days left. Um, you know, they're hope holding out for a remote learning option. They're waiting to find out if their child or if their family applies uh, or will qualify to have that remote learning option. As the options stand right now, I know you've mentioned this before, homeschooling, remote learning, if you do have any need to compromise student or in person, is that set in stone right now? So, so those are the options uh, as they exist. Um, I would say that yes, we have a, 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 an at-home learning stream for those who are immune compromised and for those who have uh, other medical conditions where it's been documented and, and verified. But we've always said, and we said it back in June, that school divisions need to prepare for other at-home learning scenarios, right? If we were in different sort of codes, we didn't have the coloring system back then, but if we were in different situations in the pandemic, that we would need to have different responses. So they have been working up robust at-home learning uh, systems and possibilities and ways to uh, enact that if the uh, if the environment changes. So we'll continually, as Dr. Rusin says, monitor that environment, continue to rely on advice of public health. Uh, so that is to say, and why I say it is that Yes, those are, those are the options now, but if we are required to change because the circumstances change, it's not like they'd be building a remote home learning option from zero. It wouldn't be like March. They've already done all of that work and all of that planning. Is there, why is remote learning not an option for everyone? So obviously one of the challenges that we've had and we work with, um, with our partners in education uh, in this is that there are uh, challenges in terms of ensuring, well, first of all, uh, the best place for a child to learn is in the classroom. Uh, that is repeated by all of the different uh, uh, experts. We saw the impact of not having uh, children in classroom in March. There's a lot of impact that, that are well beyond education. So you start from the, <clears throat> the, the de facto position that the best place for a child to learn is in the classroom. Um, but then there's other uh, issues that occur, right? I mean, if you're going to have um, uh, students at home, you need to have, uh, if they're not in a homeschooling environment, you need to have teachers there that are supporting them as well. And many teachers told us so it's very, very difficult for them to do that dual sort of track where they were teaching part of their class at home, part of their class within the class. And so that's been a reality that we've heard from uh, the Manitoba Teacher Society as well. So there's a variety of different issues. There's practical considerations, but then there's also the, uh, the reality that it is the best place for students to learn uh, in the classroom. And when you're guided by public health and, and the best medical advice and experts in Manitoba say that this is a safe way to return uh, students to school, then you want to return them to school. So not not directly. Uh, it would be um, well, it wouldn't all be anecdotal. So within the department, we have a homeschooling uh, division or a branch, and parents have to register if they're interesting uh, interested in homeschooling. Uh, so last year, I believe there was 3,800 or so uh, students who had homeschooled as of. Uh, Friday of last week, I think uh, I was told this morning that 15 or 1600 had registered. So, you know, less than l half of last year, but don't take that as an indication of what might come. Many people register near the end, I think maybe to Maggie's point, you know, people might be waiting to see, um, you know, how, how they feel or, or, or what happens. So um, we're not expecting those numbers to be less than last year, but it doesn't look like it's a tsunami either. If a family chooses to pick homeschooling, let's say, sometime this month, do they have the option to come back into the public system in October if they, you know, see things are working out? What is that? It, it's always been the option with homeschooling. And so um, parents who begin to homeschool uh, their child, my understanding is that they, and they, they, for whatever reason and circumstances change in parents' life, uh, that they uh, are not uh, able to homeschool anymore, or it's not working out for them, then a school division in their, in their catchment area has to, um, has to provide them ability to come back into the system. There is a change, and I don't know if this is a typo or a specific policy change. Instead of the one meter between desks, it's been removed to just space in this document. What's up with that? 
uh, my understanding is that you know when you're not able to achieve the two um, meters, and so you're cohorting individuals. Uh, that it was uh, that it was one meter that they were considering the standard. So the removal of the one meter from these documents is. I understood that that was still the standard. I can get back to you on that. Okay. It's in a slightly different topic, but can you talk a little bit about protocols that are in place for breakfast programs, and if a breakfast program can't abide by those protocols, what options are available, whether it's because of costs or the guidelines, uh, what happens then? So, I mean, there's a number of questions that come around, um, you know, breakfast programs. I know that school divisions who primarily run their own uh, breakfast programs have been working closely with the guidelines, have even through the summer been providing support. There was a provincial initiative as well that was um, um, providing a food and new initiative during this uh, this break where uh, parents or families could um, could pick up uh, food so there's a number of different options that exist uh, they may look different throughout the year but I think that there is a commitment from everyone in government uh, whether that's through the school divisions or through um, the province itself to ensure that that happens uh, Mr. Person, was there any real consideration to delaying the start of the school any further, especially as we're seeing uh, more cases pop up in Winnipeg and Brandon and, not in, in other districts as well? So it, it wasn't off the table, right? But it would have had to been advice that we were getting from, from public health. So public health would have said that for some reason they feel that the situation has changed in a way that the plan needs to change in a way, then that's advice that would have been followed. Um, but uh, that hasn't been the indication. But it wasn't as though there was some hard and fast uh, determination that we wouldn't. But it, it always has to be driven by what are what are the facts, Maggie? Our teachers rather are planning how their desks are going to be split up this year. Going back to Bart's point about the one meter, is it one meter between the ends of the desks or between students? Um, I believe that the has to be one meter between students. But we can get you those details. But it exists, really. Like the, that in a current classroom that students are, are one meters apart? Student to student, pre-pandemic, yeah, I mean, that's, desks are, that's, that's about the same as pre-pandemic, that is the same as pre-pandemic distance. Well, I think well, one of the differences, though, is, uh, you know, when you're cohorting, cohorting individuals, that's done for particular health reasons. Um, the one meter requirement the standard uh, is one the public health said if you're cohorting is a reasonable standard. With um, just the status of teachers as essential workers, I noticed that in the document with the response levels in red, if schools are pretty much going to have to shutter, then those um, essential service workers will, including teachers, will be able to have their students in school still. Does that mean that teachers are now deemed essential service workers? Well, teachers have special status, uh, you know, already in terms of their inability to to strike, right? And so they have uh, binding arbitration provisions already. So there are different definitions, I guess, of essential workers or essential workers as they exist within pr particular provincial legislation, or those that have sometimes been deemed that within a um, within a uh, pandemic environment. So we would be requiring the level of teachers we need to be back in classrooms. Of course, we're hoping we don't get there. I, I don't think that, uh, uh, well, I, we're hoping we don't get there. Are we calling teachers essential service workers now? Uh, I think when, when we get to that perspective, if they want to classify uh, certain groups of workers again, where we're into uh, a lockdown or a more restricted situation, then there'd be identification of individuals and workers who would be identified as essential as they were before. But that's different than a statutory definition of, of an essential worker when it comes to the ability to strike, for example. My understanding from these uh, papers is that parents will be notified if their child was in a classroom or in a cohort with an infectious student um, who had COVID-19 and was <coughs> in school when they were infectious. Does this mean that, um, you know, and if parents don't get a notification, then there's no concern to their child, but will parents be notified? Will they get information if there is a COVID case in the school, even if it's not putting their child at risk? Will that still be communicated? 
So, um, Dr. Roosten, I think, will answer some of the questions in terms of that kind of notification. I think that they've made it clear that they want to provide information that is helpful and that is important for um, students and parents to get. Um, so clearly when somebody is identified as having uh, COVID-19, they'll do the contact tracing. I understand they'll be able to do it within 24 hours as is their standard. They would then make contact uh, with those who that individual has had contact with if they found that they had not been um, uh, infectious during that time uh, in the schools, then they may not notify the schools because there wouldn't be a particular reason to. Uh, but if they were infectious in the school, then they would notify those who they believe they had uh, close contact with, which in some cases might be their entire cohort if they're cohorted, uh, but in some cases not. Um, and hopefully in most cases not because the intention isn't to shut down a cohort or a portion of a school every time that there is a positive case uh, that is found. And then they would notify the administrators of, uh, of the school to make the determination of uh, a broader notice. Uh, my belief is that we should be providing you know, as much information as we can when it comes to particular schools where there has been instances because we know what will happen otherwise, right? I mean, you're going to, if we do it in a broad-based region, uh, and, and you use Southern, for example, and this won't happen, but if you use Southern, you said, well, there was a, you know, an outbreak in a school in Southern, well, that's a pretty big area, and maybe it happened in Steinbeck, maybe it happened in Portage, maybe it happened in Winkler, but those are all great communities, but not all that close together, actually. And, uh, and so I think that um, the, the hope, uh, my hope is that it's identified more uh, distinctly within the news uh, releases that go out weekly, or daily, sorry. So that hasn't been decided yet whether or not parents will be notified if there's a been COVID-19 positive cases in their school. If there's a reason medically that, that they be notified, they would absolutely be notified. Uh, and the school administrators would be notified and they would be providing uh, information then to the broader school community that they felt uh, should be provided. But I, I would like to see uh, more transparency in terms of schools because I think it will provide less, I think it will provide more confidence and less. Yeah, I mean, given how zealous parents can get, and I'm using that term mildly, um, if they're, if what you I don't are think calling, zealous is a mild term, no matter how you use it, Bart, but you can, you can try again. <laughs> given how, let's face it, given how like anxious and kind of sure. quirky parents can get if they, if I, I can understand, when I hear you say, and you say you would like to see as much transparency as possible, if there isn't like broad disclosure, parents might rumor mongering the kinds of stigma, everything that you've been talking about, what are you going to do to nip that kind of stuff in the bud? If, if, if it's decided, well, this isn't a medical reason for notifying you about. So I've given you, I give my feeling on disclosure, but, but Dr. Reese, I'm sure, will speak more specifically about how he feels some of the disclosures should happen. Thank you, Minister. We're going to go to the telephone now. First up from City News, Stephanie. Hi, Minister. Um, Stephanie will speak with City News. Um, just wondering if you can, I guess you said that you would like to see, you know, more clarity given, but I guess parents want to know how much clarity will actually be given. And I know you said it's kind of up to Dr. Ruthen as well. Um, I just want to know, I guess, how much will actually be given to parents. I think that it's incumbent upon us to provide um, enough information that not only meets the medical need, but also meets uh, the emotional needs of parents who are in a school. I know as a parent, because uh, here's the reality, it, as a parent, I'm going to hear what's happening in the school. We're all connected to other parents. And so we're going to hear about things. Uh, and so while that's, you know, informative in one way, it's not particularly assuring. And so uh, my view is that it should be provided uh, in a, uh, a way that both assures parents from a medical perspective, but also those around that might not be anywhere close to where there was uh, an outbreak. But you can speak to uh, Dr. Rusin specifically about that tomorrow in terms of notification, because notification um, will come from public health. 
and what plans are currently in place um, if a teacher needs to go into immediate self-isolation or a teacher gets sick. Um, I know there's extra money there for extra teachers, but what plans are currently in place to kind of enforce that right away so that there is no missed um, phase of learning? So the school divisions have done uh, really good work in terms of building up their own uh, human resources. They recognize this is going to be a difficult year. There's going to be more absentees, both from a student perspective, but then also from a teacher perspective. Um, so we've also been working to ensure that there are other opportunities, whether it's retired teachers or EAs or those who are in the faculty of education, to have more ability to come into uh, the schools and provide learning or supervised uh, opportunities uh, where there are either teachers who have to leave during the day uh, or where we just find out in the morning or school just finds out in the morning or it's a longer term absence. So it, it is going to be a challenge. We've been saying that for months now that both busing and uh, human resources are going to be a challenge. I think both, both of those are going to be true. But there's been good work done in terms of trying to expand the net in terms of those who can be providing that instruction or supervision within the class where an unexpected or a long-term um, situation happens where a teacher is out of the classroom. From the Brandon Sun, Colin. Hi, Minister. Uh, Colin from the Brandon Sun here. Um, I was wondering if there already hasn't been a little confusion over um, all sorts of different uh, entities in Brandon being under different uh, color conditions in the pandemic response system. What will the government and school divisions be expected to do to inform parents if there is any change at a school or Level. Yeah, so th thanks for that. And no, I recognize that, that there's been uh, some confusion when it comes to the different uh, color coding in which state either a, an area is under uh, separate from a school. Um, and sort of as mentioned before, you can have situations where certain parts of a region are under a different um, alert level. So as I mentioned before, a PCH within my own community that I live in might be under red, but the entire city uh, is still under yellow. So those aren't contradictory. They are just different environments um, that they're trying to manage. And so public health sees the school environment uh, as different in terms of than the broader uh, community environment. They felt that it was uh, appropriate to keep the school environment in Brandon still under yellow. In terms of communication, though, you're absolutely right. If there is a change uh, in, in one form or another in terms of what uh, code a school uh, or a division might be uh, under, that information uh, would go uh, directly to, uh, to the parents and obviously as quickly as possible. But there would obviously be in a situation like that if you're talking about moving from a broad uh, color coding on one area to another, there'd be a much broader public communications as well. Um, so will they get phone calls? Will they get emails? Like, uh, how will parents be, you know, how will parents be reached out to? So, so in the best way that they've determined that they want to be contacted with. So already now, uh, schools and school divisions uh, connect with parents in the way that they've been provided the parents' information. So over the summer, for example, a number of the school divisions will have had contacts, uh, a great deal of contacts with parents to ask them things like, can you bring your child to school, for example, because we might have some challenges with, with busing. And they will have been contacting them uh, in the way that uh, parents have indicated is the best way to be contacted with. From CBC Radio Canada, Laisa. No question. From CTV Winnipeg, John. Hello, Minister. John Hendricks from CTV. Um, based on your previous answer, my understanding of why you won't allow parents to choose remote learning is because you're concerned about the burden on teachers. But aren't they already, in essence, going to be providing 
some remote learning options for students anyway, uh, for those who are immunocompromised, for those who are required to self-isolate. So what would be the burden then of offering it as an option for all parents? Yeah, thanks, John, for the, for the question. Uh, again, the primary consideration is that uh, it is believed, and I think it's believed by teachers and others, that the best learning environment for the majority of students is in the classroom. And so that's sort of the default position. Uh, it's the position uh, that we saw in March. We saw lots of negative implications of students not being uh, in class in the uh, in the spring a lot of them that had to do with education outcomes and a lot of them that didn't have to do specifically with education outcomes so the default position the starting position is that it is best for students to be in the classroom where it is safe uh, and then we move to the guidance from public health in developing this back to school plan where the determination uh, from them together with health measures that have been put in place through their advice is that it is safe for students to go back to school. Then you step uh, one step out and go, but there are certain students for whom uh, it might not be the best place to be because they are immune compromised or other medical conditions. And so then you ensure that there is um, an ability for the school divisions to uh, provide that. So those are the starting points. But then when you go much more broadly than that, uh, if you're going to have you know, significant higher scale of students who are not in the classroom and but are looking for that teacher-led learning, uh, then that is an entirely different challenge and problem. In fact, if you just even go back to June, where we were looking to have the schools open on a more limited basis, and ultimately we did have them open on a limited basis fairly successfully, uh, only us, BC and Quebec, I believe, reopened schools in, uh, in some fashion in the June. Still, the greatest concern that we had, and we heard the questions from, from uh, media here, uh, on behalf of, of teachers who are asking the questions, is, well, how do you expect teachers to do both? Both have at-home learning and now some in-class learning. So that has always been a concern uh, from, uh, from teachers all through this process. Uh, thank you. My other question is, has the province uh, received or sought out any legal opinion as to whether or not um, the school division or the province itself would be legally liable should a child or teacher contract uh, COVID-19? Uh, I've not seen uh, a legal opinion, nor have I asked for a legal opinion on that. From CBC, Cameron. Hi, Minister. My question is about homeschooling. Um, we've had some parents ask if multiple children can attend a homeschool at the same location. Uh, is that possible, and, and what regulations would apply if so? So, uh, thanks, Cameron. I'm, I'm not an expert on, on homeschooling. I've not homeschooled uh, uh, my own children. Um, I do know that there are... Uh, homeschooling groups so that there are that there are groups of children from different families who are uh, homeschooled together that's not an unusual thing I don't believe in uh, in Manitoba that's the way some parents uh, have structured it um, but obviously they would have to follow whatever health guidelines that exist uh, and to ensure that they're not uh, you know violating whether it's gathering sizes or, or the various uh, health provisions that exist, I can I can provide you you know um, some of the specific uh, policy uh, provisions around homeschooling if you like. But I believe that there are um, a number of uh, homeschooling families who do exactly that, where it's not just their own child that are uh, being homeschooled. Thanks, and uh, just uh, Another follow-up question: If a ch parent chooses to um, homeschool their kid for, say, the start of the year, and then decides they want them to go back, they uh, there's nothing preventing them doing so if they want to send their child to uh, school within their home school district. Is that correct? That's correct. the The home school district has to uh, allow them to be back. 
uh, within the school system if they choose, because as you can imagine, there's lots of scenarios that can happen within a family that can change that dynamic. Thank you, Minister. We now go back to room 68. Minister, just more on this one meter business. Um, my colleagues have been inside a school where the desks are actually, the desks, not even the students, are less than a meter apart. Uh, what's the province doing to police that? So we have, you know, made it clear to the different schools and school divisions that as we announced back in June that we put out the overall uh, parameters of what needs to be achieved. Um, and then they started to work on their individual division plans and ultimately their individual school plans. And those school plans have then been communicated out to parents uh, who have students within those individual schools. Uh, we have um, daily conversations with uh, representatives of the various stakeholders, whether that's Manitoba Teachers Society, the school trustees, Federation of Independent Schools, superintendents. They're all well aware of, uh, of the requirements and the public health requirements. I believe that they're all doing you know, really hard but really you know, good work in trying to ensure um, that they're meeting all of those. Uh, and, uh, and as we continue to have those discussions with them, if, if they are having challenges with that, if they have challenges with busing, and there's been challenges with busing, and they've come back and they've raised those concerns to us, then we do our best to work through those challenges with, with public health. So if there are instances where those public health provisions are not being met, I would expect that they'd be reported from the officials uh, because if not, I'm sure that we'd be hearing them in other ways from concerned parents or otherwise. Will you be, or when will you be publishing a more detailed list of medical conditions that may allow students to not wear masks? So I, I think that it's uh, discussed somewhat in the documents that are provided here. And the advice, I believe, is that you know parents should speak to their uh, family physician or a student should be speaking to their family physician if they feel that they're unable to uh, to wear a mask. Those circumstances are probably relatively few, but I'm not a medical uh, doctor, so I won't presume that. And um, and they should have that discussion with their doctors, and then the parents can document that for the uh, for the schools if their child uh, is unable to wear a mask. Okay, we have time for one or two more. When it comes to students potentially, you know, breaking a social distancing rule, um, you know, sort of bullying, is there a protocol for how schools should handle that when it comes to either penalties or sort of justice or any kind of approach? Well, I mean, they're, so they're a little different, right? I mean, if, if, um, if there's a one meter that's, or sorry, two meters that's breached, uh, on the physical distancing, you know, I would say handle it in the way that Manitobans handle things, and that's sort of reasonably. Uh, I mean, I do believe that 95, uh, more than 95 percent of Manitobans uh, are doing uh, their absolute best uh, to try to follow health uh, provisions and health protocols. Uh, but you know, sometimes people make mistakes, and I've made some of those mistakes too. And I think you've documented some of those mistakes and you'll continue to document them and that's fine. Uh, but, but there are mistakes that get made, but I don't think it's uh, generally because it's purposeful. So I think where that happens, then school officials or teachers will, you know, sort of gently remind uh, students, you know, to oh, we're looking for that two meters distance and they'll do it uh, reasonably and respectfully as I, as I think people uh, should expect. Uh, when it comes to bullying, now that's something different, and and uh, if that is going to be, you know, that that might result in in punishment. Is bullying always should? Uh, you know, we have to be mindful of the fact that people are in different circumstances and different life realities. And yes, as Bart says, there's going to be some students who aren't wearing masks for whatever uh, reasons that that they have that have been uh, that have been documented. Um, but we don't know what those reasons are, and so we should be respectful of them in the same way uh, for other students who are, are uh, wearing masks, and, and we need to be respectful on all sides. I mean, it, it doesn't take that much to, um, to be respectful of each other. Yeah, it's stressful. Yes, there's anxiety. I get all of that. I have all of that. Um, but 
that doesn't mean we can't be respectful to each other. I'm kind of adding on to that point. There's a new report that came out that shows um, the kind of the toll COVID-19 has taken on children, uh, basically in terms of mental illness, poverty, that sort of thing, basically making a bad situation worse. What supports are in place in Manitoba schools to help children that are maybe really struggling more than others uh, because of COVID-19, whether it's anxiety or mental illness issues? So, so the study shows, shows a couple of things, right? It, it absolutely shows the anxiety and the mental health challenges that students, and probably not just students, society as a whole, I'm sure, are, are, uh, are facing. But then it also shows the impact of what happened when schools weren't open in the spring. And so what did that do to, to you know, food insecurity? What did that do to you know children who were relying on things in schools for other things? So yes, it speaks to the need for many school uh, students to be back in school. They relied on that school environment for a lot of things that had more to do than just education. So the impact of having schools closed, which speaks to the importance of having our schools open in a safe way, uh, and then the resources that uh, exist within schools, and there are. There are multitudes of them uh, and multitude of, of programs. They may have to be delivered in a bit of a different way because we may not have as many people coming into the school from the outside as we did before, but they also have to be flexible. So whether we've been talking to providers from the uh, True North Youth Foundation uh, or Sheldon Kennedy's group or the wraparound services that exist with uh, uh, psychiatric uh, nurses, I mean, those are all things that may have to be adapted as we go along because we know we almost know for sure i hate to say that anything's for sure these days but we almost know for sure there's going to be impact on students from a mental health perspective i don't know that we quite understand the depth of that or what that actually um, results in so there's going to be a lot of a lot of watching observing and then changing i think as we go along with some of the programs funding for those extra programs that may be needed or to adjust those programs? Is that going to be expected to come out of the $100 million pot that was set aside? So, I mean, we've announced, as you mentioned, the, the $100 million, uh, which is being accessed in a lot of different ways, but we've said to school divisions uh, all along, uh, we're, and we, we speak with them daily through their associations, and we will continue as we go uh, into the opening, that we need to find out you know, what are the different challenges you're facing? So some of that might be mental health, some of that will be human resources, some of that will continue to be busing, and then uh, then we want to be there to to support those needs uh, as best we can, right? The, uh, the right approach, though, is to not say, here's X amount of hundreds of millions of dollars, now everybody sort of reach in and, and take what you'd like. The, the right approach is, what are your needs? And then let's assign uh, resources to meet those needs. Okay, I think we'll wrap it up there. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you all. Have a great rest of the day and remainder of the week.